So I know that I'm showing up as Tom. Um, I wasn't able to change it. Um, my real name is Sindre Lindstad and you know, why I was called Tom in the first place, that's a whole different story. So that's for another time. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the year 2038 problem. Um, I work for a company called Entur or One Trip in English. Um, we work with public transportation systems and we'll do a lot of really uh, cool stuff. Um, but um, the thought of the year 2038 problem that I just came across in an article really got me thinking about a different type of travel, um, namely time travel. Because I figured that the year 2038 problem would be a real issue to them. Um, and I'm going to explain that in, in a few minutes. Um, but there's, you know, I had to make some, I had to cut some corners to sort of make the year 2008 problem fit into this, um, this case. So I'm going to have to ask you to just go along with it, even though it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, don't worry. Um, uh, even if it doesn't make sense and it doesn't seem like there's some logic to it, um, don't worry, because uh, where we're going, uh, we don't need logic. And that's a movie reference. If we go back to the year 1985 um, and the month of October, it was a really interesting month. A lot of really cool stuff happened. First of all, the i386 processor from Intel came out, which was the first generally available 32-bit processor uh, on the market. That same year, Dr. Emmett Brown also invented the time machine, and it was covered in great detail in the documentary film series, Back to the Future. So I'm sure of you, um, like many of you have probably um, seen it before. Um, you probably also know then that Einstein was the world's first time traveler. And for those who don't remember, Einstein was Dr. Emmett Brown's dog. The machine that they would travel in time with was based on a GMC DeLorean. It has a stainless steel body, which is a really good quality when you're fitting it with a flux capacitor, which is like the main device that makes time travel possible. The downside to the flux capacitor is that it requires a lot of power. Like you have to uh, feed it 1.21 uh, gigawatts for it to work. And to solve that, he had to fit um, a nuclear reactor as a power source into the vehicle. Um, later, he fitted a uh, Mr. Fusion home energy reactor, but you know, for this case, we'll just stick with the plutonium. So how it works is you would add one pellet of plutonium, and one pellet of plutonium would be enough for one trip. Then there is an input panel inside the vehicle where you would enter the time um, of your arrival. And let's say that in this case, uh, we want to go to October 21st, 2015, and we set the time. Then we accelerate to 88 miles an hour, then bam, like in a flash, you just suddenly disappear. Um, and then you're, you're, you're gone because you're, you're off traveling in time. You could travel um, into the future, into the past. It certainly was a very uh, impressive invention. Dr. Emmett Brown was certainly a genius, but we do know that he has some flaws. Um, like we know that he did conduct a lot of really dangerous experiments in public, like he did the, some of the first attempts at time travel were done at a, uh, at a mall. Um, so it really like endangered the public and, uh, it would certainly also make him very prone to theft. Like a lot of people would probably be able to just see and steal his tech. So we can assume that people would be able to copy it. He was also affiliated with known criminals. Um, he got the plutonium off of Libyan terrorists. So he certainly had some, um, some sketchy connections. Judging from his workspace, we could probably assume that he was severely disorganized. And um, judging from his craftsmanship, when you look at his inventions, uh, we can probably assume that um, he's very prone to taking some shortcuts. And if we take all these factors into consideration, we could also conclude that he probably doesn't unit test. So let's take a look at um, how he might have implemented some of uh, the control systems on board. Um, so this is the algorithm. Well, let's say he's written it in C and he's using the time T data type um, that uses 32-bit signed int. 
Um, so the algorithm here is basically that it fetches the input from the input panel, well, year, month, uh, day, hour, and minute of the arrival time, and then um, goes into a while loop um, where that input is, um, well, you have the, the, the arrival time as a timestamp, and then in, a, in an infinite loop, you just match that with the current timestamp. And if it matches, you break out of the loop, and then you stop the flux capacitor. And as you uh, stop the capacitor, um, you arrive safely at that point in time where you wanted to, um, to go. Um, now, this is obviously very basic. Um, you know, it doesn't handle errors very well. And uh, it's using the time t data type, which is using a 32-bit signed int, which has a maximum value of around 2.1 billion. And we know that Unix timestamp is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. So we can tell that the um, furthest you could travel into the future, if you're using a timestamp like this, is um, to January 19, 2038. Now, what happens when that int overflows is that it just keeps, you know, um, let's say it's an incremental count. It just, when it hits that limit, it will, in most systems, will depends a bit on the implementation, but on most systems, it will just turn into a negative number where it will just start from the, the, um, the minimum value. Um, which means as you're hitting 2038, um, you will basically get thrown back to a timestamp that represents 1901. Now, this is obviously an issue as you're traveling in time. Um, so if you're taking some shortcuts and you're using um, um, the Unix timestamps for this, and um, let's say you're in 1985, you've stolen or copied Dr. Emmett's Brown invention, it's um, you even have his source code. Everything is running exactly as he would. And you have one pellet of plutonium, like but like even if you just get one uh, pellet of plutonium, that's quite impressive because you know plutonium is very hard to get by. But you figure that you're going into the future anyway, right? So in the future, everybody has plutonium, so it's not going to be an issue. And you don't want to go like you don't want to go to 2015. You want to go into the proper future. You want to see flying cars. So you want to go to 2050, right? Now, I'm sure many of you um, can catch where this is going, right? Um, in a worst case scenario where the overflow isn't handled very well and the algorithm just keeps on going, like the numbers will never match, you will essentially just be sent off um, into nothingness. Um, you will basically be lost in time, never to return. In a best case scenario, the overflow is handled, but you know, it will flow over and then start back at the minimum value and count upwards, and then you'll effectively end back in 1914. Now you only brought one pellet of plutonium, so that means you're probably not making it back. That also means that there's, you know, um, somewhat likely that somewhere around maybe 1914 or maybe around the 1910s. There's a group of really disgruntled and disappointed um, scientists who never managed to get back to 1985. Now, this is what we call the year 2038 problem or the Unix Y2K. And the reason why it's called the Unix Y2K is because it's very similar to the Y2K issue that we all know. I just want to say that one of the reasons why the Y2K issue didn't have uh, the grave consequences that many uh, said it would have was because a lot of people put in a lot of effort to fix vulnerabilities in systems. Um, so it wasn't something that just fixed itself. Um, and perhaps this is something that we should, you know, take into consider consideration when we're uh, talking about the 2038 problem as well. But if we fast forward into the present, um, you know, certainly this is not an issue anymore, right? Like we've got 64 bit systems and all sorts of data types that can handle uh, like any number thinkable. But, th but there are still some examples, uh, say with the Boeing 787, it turns out a few years ago that it had an, um, an issue that if it ran for 248 uh, consecutive days without being shut down, the generators would fail. And if you do the math, um, if you look at a maximum value of a 32-bit signed in, that's about 2.1 billion. And then you, well, let's say it's, you know, probably some sort of embedded system that has like a 10 millisecond tick count or something. 
Um, so we counted in centiseconds and then two days. We'll see that that's roughly 248 days. And that's certainly not a coincidence. So um, even in like really expensive and large uh, machines like this, we can find issues like this. Another example uh, is the Unix timestamp function that's in several um, SQL languages. Um, if you go past the year 2038 and January 19, you will just um, get a zero in return. I pulled the latest version of my SQL to, to see if it still applies and it still does. So if you have some sort of queries running in production that's going to last for the next like 15, 16 or 17 years, um, you should probably you know, um, have a look at them. And this has been known for a long time, the, the MySQL thing. Uh, it was first posted on the um, MySQL um, um, ticketing um, um, forum about in like 2005. Um, and it still hasn't been fixed. Um, now, the bad thing is that it hasn't been fixed, but the good thing is that we now can blame Oracle for it. Now, it does have some real life uh, uh, complications as well um, in, say, you know, medical equipment, in banking, in embedded control systems for you know, water plants or, or anything. Um, this could be an issue, as well as military devices. You know, if you're launching, launching a rocket, um, um, that might affect where it would land. So what do we learn from this? Um, the take homes are that you have to be aware of data type limits. Like even today, even though we have uh, a range of different data types that we can choose from, um, make sure that it doesn't bite you. Check your SQL queries so you don't use the Unix timestamp function where you shouldn't. Remember to reboot your airplanes or the generators will fail. And if you're going to travel in time, you should always take some extra plutonium because uh, you never know when you might get stuck at some point in time and you're unable to get back. And that's it. Thank you very much.